René Magritte was an artist who painted everyday objects in such unreal combinations and relationships that they made the viewer question the nature of reality. Magritte saw himself as a philosopher, rather than a painter, and, as a thinker inspired by the poetry and the mystery of the everyday. To all outward appearances, Magritte was placidly middle class. He kept a modest house in a nondescript Belgian suburb. He married his childhood sweetheart. He socialized, mainly at home. He set up his easel in a corner of the dining room, and painted in suit and tie. He was the epitome of respectability. But, blending in was part of his trick of keeping us off guard, so that the shock, of his art would be even more unexpected. René Magritte, the eldest of three boys, was born in Belgium in 1898. His father was a tailor, and his mother a milliner before she was married. When Magritte was 14, his mother who suffered from severe depression, committed suicide, drowning herself in a river. Her body was later discovered a mile or so downstream. René was profoundly influenced by his mother's death. Some have said that its effect can be seen in the style and content of many of his later paintings. Magritte, however, never agreed, claiming there was no hidden meaning in what he painted. He had no time for psychology. Germany invaded Belgium in August 1914, and 16-year-old Magritte dropped out of school. In order to continue his art studies, he left his family and moved to Brussels. He took a room at a boarding house near the art academy in an effort to learn much-needed painting techniques. From 1916 to 1920, Magritte attended the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Brussels, where he studied drawing, decorative painting and ornamental composition. He showed something of an antisocial tendency, and found it difficult to conform to conventions. Finally, he left the school, because he thought that it was a waste of time. In 1918, Magritte began work as a draftsman for a wallpaper company. There, he met the artist Victor Servrank, who painted non-figurative art. Magritte worked under Servrank's supervision, and they became friends and collaborators. In 1919, Pierre-Louis Fluquet, a French artist living in Brussels, shared his workshop with Magritte. Fluquet introduced Magritte to other Cubists and Futurists, and he also got acquainted with the Antwerp avant-garde, including the figurative Cubism of Jean Metzinger. At the time, Magritte's work was heavily influenced by the pictures that his contemporaries produced, and, they in turn were influenced by the paintings of Pablo Picasso and Georges Braque, who were rapidly developing Cubism at the time. You can see these influences in some of Magritte's early works, from the 1920s, shown here. In 1922, René Magritte married Georgette Berger. Georgette first met Magritte when she was 13 and he was 15. They met again seven years later in Brussels in 1920, and Georgette, who had also studied art, became Magritte's model, muse, and wife. In the same year, Magritte was shown a reproduction of Giorgio de Chirico's painting, The Song of Love. He later described this as one of the most moving moments of his life. The strange juxtaposition of objects in de Chirico's work revealed to Magritte the poetic possibilities of painting, and, from then on, he adopted a similar painting style, deciding to make each of his painting into what he called a visual poem. Magritte began his new direction in art around 1924, and became an active participant in Dadaism and the Belgian branch of Surrealism which was established in 1925. The Belgian Surrealists were an ultra-conservative lot, who valued anonymity and secrecy. Magritte's personal philosophy aligned with these ideas, and it explains why in a later interview he claimed to have no talent, no originality and no artistic aptitude. 
He was a quiet and contemplative man, prone to anonymity and camouflage, just like his Belgian surrealist companions. In 1924, Magritte began designing posters and advertisements for Noreen, a Belgian fashion company. The owner also owned an art gallery, and, was an early champion of surrealism. He eventually paid Magritte a retainer in exchange for the right to market his surrealist works. In 1926, Magritte was commissioned to create this poster for a popular singer. An original print was recently sold at Christie's for $25,000. The poster led to a contract at a local art gallery, which allowed Magritte to become a full-time artist for the first time. That year, Magritte created what he considered his first surrealist painting, The Lost Jockey. It is one of his many paintings showing a theater curtain. This work also contains an object that looks like a chess piece, known as a bill bouquet, which is part of a game. In this painting, the bill bouquets resemble trees, with musical notation as bark. The bill bouquet began to appear frequently in his paintings, collages, and commercial works, as a stand-in for a person, or an everyday object, giving them a new and disturbing presence. The 1926 version of Magritte's painting, The Difficult Crossing, also contains the Beale bouquet, here it supports a single eye. Also common at that time, was the ambiguity between a window, and a painting on the wall. In this work, which shows a sailing boat in a thunderstorm, the viewer is left to wonder if we are looking at a painting, or the view from a window. Magritte went on to extend this idea in his series called, The Human Condition, which we will see later, where outdoor paintings and windows, both appear, and even overlap. In 1927, Magritte was given his first solo exhibition, at a gallery in Brussels, which launched his career as Brussels' leading professional surrealist painter. Most of the canvases were painted in the Cubist style. He also showed his first experiments in surrealism. These works contained what would become the artist's signature motifs, bowler hats, theater curtains and mysterious landscapes. Magritte's largest and most theatrical composition, The Menaced Assassin, was also displayed at the show. Magritte was an avid fan of a popular crime fiction magazine called The Phantom. He attempted to create a similarly fantastic world on his canvas, here shown as the unsolvable plot of this mysterious painting. His work didn't please the critics, or the conservative art crowd at the time, but all agreed that Magritte was skilled at painting, and arranging ordinary objects in an extraordinary way. Salvador Dali, who painted during the same period, would melt a watch, playing with the consistency of the object. In Magritte's paintings, objects were left intact, but he would play with their placement in reality. What really upset the critics, was that Magritte's pictures did not provide any answers, only questions. Magritte was more focused on the way he expressed his ideas, and how to touch the viewer with his visual poetry, than justifying his art. In 1927, Magritte and his wife moved to Paris in the hope of joining the French Surrealist group. His three years there, would be the most prolific of his life, sometimes painting three canvases in a week. Magritte's relationship with the French Surrealists never grew to be very close. He respected and admired the artists and writers there, but always maintained a distance, both intellectually and geographically from them. He lived on the outskirts of Paris. It wasn't easy for the Belgian to gain access to the French Surrealists' inner circle. And, although they overwhelmed Magritte with demands on his time, they neither urged him to sign important published works with other artists, nor was he mentioned in the book Surrealism and Painting, published by the group in 1928. For his part, Magritte never fully embraced the Surrealists' painting theories practiced, to varying degrees, by the artists around him. He was suspicious of their so-called spontaneity, and the appeal to the subconscious aspect of their techniques. Magritte, with his middle-class ideas and values, was something of an outsider in the group. 
Magritte's first Paris painting was, The Muscles of the Sky, where he cut pieces of the sky, and turned them into strange life forms. By combining the physical with abstraction, Magritte created a pictorial paradox that is possible only in painting. The impression here, is of something disturbing and yet recognizable, suggesting a half-remembered familiarity, that is fundamental to Magritte's art. Not only did Magritte begin to develop his mature style during this period, he also carried out experiments with words and images in his paintings, to add further to their mystery. This work is an early example, which shows a crude image of a pipe labeled, The Pipe. In 1927, he published an essay called, Words and Images, in which he points out relationships between words, and painted objects. By dividing an object's visual and verbal signs, image and language interrupt one another, causing viewers to question which is more real than the other. In this painting, The Interpretation of Dreams, he paired words and images, using the format of a child's picture book. Misnaming objects was one of Magritte's key strategies for making familiar things look unfamiliar and, also, for reminding us that pictures of things, are not the same as the things themselves. After Magritte and his wife had been living in Paris for two years, and Magritte had already painted over 100 new pictures, his article, Words and Images, was published in the group's own publication, The Surrealist Revolution, which led to him finally being accepted by the group. He also contributed an article, The Treachery of Images, to the 1929 issue, and his painting, The Hidden Woman, shown here, appeared on the front cover. Magritte's essay summed up his two years of intense exploration into how language and images function together. His idea was that reality as we know it is not fixed, but constructed. A painting is a representation of an object, but never the object itself. On this picture he writes, this is not a pipe, meaning that in fact it's just a painting of a pipe. Painting is a representation of an object, but never the real object. Far from being trivial, the idea looks at the difference between art and reality. This idea is explored further in Magritte's painting, The Mysteries of the Horizon. It shows three seemingly identical men in bowler hats. They are out of doors at twilight. Each one is looking in a different direction. In the sky above each figure, is a separate crescent moon. Magritte's painting is based on the idea that there is no truth other than that which each individual perceives. Our perception of the world changes, depending on our own view of it. In other words, we must find our own reality. Magritte's early self-portraits are not really about him, but are used as a vehicle for further exploring the problems of visual perception and reality. In this painting, Magritte uses his deadpan style to depict himself painting a likeness of his wife. However, within the picture, instead of painting onto a canvas, he is painting her into existence. Magritte's theme for this painting is thought to be the ancient story of an artist who created a living woman for himself through his art, truly attempting the impossible, as the title suggests. Magritte questioned our understanding of objects, images, and their meaning by placing them in strange and curious contexts. Objects in his paintings often defy the principles of physics and logic. An example is this work, The Titanic Days, which refers to both the mythological clash of the titans, and to the struggle between the two figures shown here. Within the outline of a struggling nude woman, the artist has drawn a man who is attempting to attack her. The two bodies, united within the same figure, and the color contrast between the two, give a harsh animation to the painting. The dark silhouette of the attacker follows the shape of the body of the victim, giving us a sense of his total control. There is a flatness to this work that is very disturbing. Magritte manages to destroy the conventions of pictorial space by forcing the bodies into one plane. It is one of the most disturbing images Magritte ever painted. It displays a fierce and sensual, yet cold animation, 
that Magritte never quite equaled again. Magritte's paintings are noted for challenging the viewer's perception of reality. Here, in The Acrobat's Ideas, Magritte humorously shows the physical gymnastics an acrobat must undergo throughout her routine. Central to Magritte's art is his conviction that the role of painting is not to represent, but to stimulate a reaction at an altogether deeper level. He treated the obvious with corrosive humor, as a way of undermining the foundation of things that we see around us. In his painting, The Hunters at the Edge of Night, we get the idea that the hunters feel trapped, unable to continue their journey to the horizon, which is just out of their reach. To us the solution is obvious. We feel frustrated, if only we could communicate it. Magritte has got us thinking. Magritte began painting sky pictures in the early 1930s, including the four-paneled celestial perfections, shown here. There is something odd about these sky-filled canvases. They seem to lack any frame of reference to the world that surrounds the sky. It is almost as if we are looking through a window at another world. It is interesting to note that the four canvases sold at auction in 2004 for $5.4 million. Magritte used the multi-frame approach to painting again in this work, with quite a different message. In a challenge to the traditional artistic subject of the female nude, Magritte divided the body into five framed and isolated sections. By physically deconstructing the image, the artist forces the viewer to engage and complete the painting in their mind. With these works, Magritte succeeded in revealing the tensions between paintings as an image and paintings as objects more convincingly than ever before. By 1930, Magritte, who was still in Paris, became tired of waiting for a one-man exhibition in France. Paris was in the midst of a recession after the 1929 Great Depression. His friends were forced to close their Paris galleries and, Many collectors and galleries were bankrupt. Magritte no longer had a steady income, and his relationship with the Surrealists had deteriorated badly. Magritte and his wife, feeling homesick, returned to Belgium. Magritte resumed working in advertising. He and his brother Paul formed an agency called Studio Donga. They worked from a tumble-down shack that he built in his garden. Magritte created posters, music covers and advertisements, right up until the 1950s, long after he had become internationally acknowledged as an artist. He never abandoned the commercial world, but went on appropriating its advertising strategies into much of the art he produced. Magritte's house now became the headquarters of the Belgian Surrealists, who met weekly and organized all kinds of performances. Magritte painted half of his 1600 canvases in the dining room that doubled as his studio. He used many items in his apartment as models for his paintings, such as the fireplace, the windows inside the house, and the staircase. Over the next few years, Magritte was very productive. He continued to experiment with unusual combinations of objects and produced some of his best known works. Not only did he create new and provocative ways of seeing, but he challenged the viewer, in a series of original and at times erotic images, to address our own notions of sexuality, voyeurism and desire. In this painting, he combines human feet with leather, to form a new and monstrous object, the frightening reversal when the outside becomes the inside. The boot as a container holds the foot, or, is it the other way around? Occasionally, Magritte adopted the role of emotionally involved voyeur. His engagement with the subject often took the form of fetishism, whereby a familiar object, such as a woman's nightdress, reveals what it normally conceals, namely the woman's body beneath. The impersonal nature of this transaction, in which the real, living woman has no obvious part, is what really makes this image seem so shocking. Magritte revealed the strangeness hidden behind the most familiar things in this painting, the collective invention 
which shows a fish, merged with a woman's legs, stranded on the beach. In this mockery of the legendary mermaid, Magritte's painting strips away the beauty and mystery surrounding the mermaid by using the opposite, a woman's legs and a fish's head. This work is the stark opposite to mermaids or sirens, who in myth, lured men into the sea, with their beauty. Frustrated desires are a common theme in Magritte's work. Here, he presents two lovers, with their faces covered by a white cloth trying to kiss, but unable to do so. It is a masterpiece of sexual frustration. The room around them also speaks of a kind of middle-class imprisonment, a couple, occupying the same space, but no longer able to truly communicate. Here, Magritte has taken some of the most primal human urges, love and companionship, and mars their beauty with obfuscation and irreverence. It is up to the viewer to determine what is meant by these works, and this is one of the most interesting aspects of Magritte's form of surrealism. After all, what better way to ponder surrealist love than with a hood over your head? In 1937, Edward James, an English heir to an American railroad fortune, and an influential patron of surrealist art, invited Magritte to paint during the winter months at his home in London. For the following two years, James commissioned a number of works from the painter, while he lived there. Of these commissions, two are portraits of the patron. Magritte's first portrait of James, The Pleasure Principle, contains several recognizable themes from Magritte's body of work, an uncanny alteration of the familiar, and, the tension between the visible and the hidden. In 2018, this painting sold at Sotheby's New York for $26.8 million, setting a new record for the artist. In his second James portrait, shown here, Magritte uses the double motif that had fascinated him since the 1920s. A man is looking at himself in a mirror, but instead of reflecting his face, it shows him his back. The book on the mantelpiece, however, is reflected, as expected, and is reversed. One of Magritte's most common artistic devices was the use of objects to hide what lies behind them. In this painting, The Human Condition, the cover-up appears in the form of a painting within a painting, which is Magritte's earliest treatments of the subject. The painting shows an easel in a room in front of a window. The easel holds an unframed painting of a landscape that seems, in every detail, to match the landscape seen outside the window. At first, one automatically assumes that the painting on the easel shows the portion of the landscape outside the window that it hides from view. However, Magritte's painting itself is real, while the painting on the easel is only a representation of that reality. But both are part of the same artistic fabrication. It is this repeating cycle, what Magritte called the human condition, in which the viewer, even against their will, sees the one as real and the other as a representation, that leads to Magritte's picture title. Paintings within paintings appear frequently in Magritte's works. Euclidean Walks, shown here, is a painting most like the human condition. It places a canvas in front of a high window, showing the tower of a close building, and a street below. The similarity between the shape of the tower and the shape of the street, running off into the distance, creates a feeling of uncertainty for the viewer, which is the picture's appeal. Another window painting, The Key to the Fields, shows a broken window, whose shattered glass pieces on the floor still show the outside world they may have concealed. Magritte's works are conceived of as riddles. In them, he explores the mysteries lurking in the unexpected juxtaposition of everyday things, involving the viewer, in a self-induced disorientation. His paintings do not include symbols and myths, everything is visible. His titles, accompany the paintings without illustrating or explaining them, although, frequently adding to the mystery. Vengeance, painted in 1936, 
is another picture within a picture that Magritte produced to explore the loose and ambiguous relationship that exists between image and representation. As you can see, it shows a landscape, invading a room through the window of a painted canvas standing on an easel at its center. With its paradoxical portrayal of the outside world coexisting inside an enclosed room, the picture on the easel is a kind of magical portal, where clouds appear to have entered, and, now float against the empty back wall of the room. The only other, intruder in this peaceful scene is a solitary metal ball on the floor, which is similar to the bells used on horses' bridles. This is a frequently appearing motif in Magritte's paintings, which he used to reinforce the picture's surprises. It is a reminder, that within the playful, painted world of Magritte's universe, anything is possible. During his earlier stay in Paris, Magritte's relationship with his surrealist colleagues had been far from ideal. These surrealists had been scornful of Magritte's homebody, rather than bohemian, lifestyle. Magritte, in turn, had scolded and ridiculed the surrealist addiction to psychoanalysis and the works of Sigmund Freud. Magritte had always been opposed to psychoanalysis, believing that art doesn't need interpretation. Years later, he expressed his ridicule in this work, known as, The Therapist. Like many of Magritte's subjects, this one doesn't have a face. But, he opens his cloak wide, as if to allow the viewer to look into his soul. Surprisingly, despite his dislike of psychotherapists, Magritte managed to portray the principle of their work with some subtlety here. A little-known fact about Magritte's work, were his photographs. These were discovered in the mid-1970s, almost a decade after his death. The works ranged from the intimate snapshots that he captured for family albums, to the experimental works he produced as aids for his painting. He bought his first camera when he moved to Paris from Belgium with his wife in 1927. In this, anti-portrait, Magritte captures an artist friend concealing his face behind a chessboard, forcing the viewer to concentrate on the details of his clothing, and the pipe that he holds in his hand. Magritte was determined to use photography to explore what he called, the mysteries of the universe. One of Magritte's favorite methods in generating such intrigue, was to obscure one object behind another, especially faces. We always want to see what is hidden, behind the object in front, he said. These works show a more intimate side of Magritte, the fun-loving family man. He didn't want to be serious in front of the camera, he loved to play and to act. But at heart, he never stopped trying to discover what is possible through his art. Strange as it seems, Magritte refused to exhibit or reproduce his photographic works during his lifetime, so we seldom associated him with image-making today. In the late 1930s, Magritte frequently traveled to London to prepare for his painting exhibitions. While there, he started an affair with the artist, Sheila Legg, a producer of surrealist events, who worked with Salvador Dali, and other artists at the time. Magritte wanted to avoid arousing his wife's suspicions while he was away, so he arranged for a friend, to spend time with Georgette to keep her company. Georgette and Magritte's friend, became romantically involved. Georgette at one point, asked Magritte for a divorce. In 1940, German troops invaded Belgium and Holland in World War II. Magritte, fearful that he would be picked up for his communist political statements, fled Brussels and his marital problems for France. His wife didn't go with him, as the two had recently separated. Magritte spent three months in France, with artist friends. This work, Homesickness, painted at the time, shows a forlorn Magritte, dressed as an angel, leaning over a bridge contemplating the river. Perhaps he is thinking of suicide. He was losing the two things he most valued in his life, his wife Georgette, and his home in Belgium. When conditions allowed, Magritte returned to Brussels in May 1940, 
and eventually reconciled with his wife. His decision to remain in Belgium following the German occupation caused a split between Magritte and the Surrealists in Paris. The suffering and violence caused by the war led Magritte away from what he now saw as the dark and chaotic moods of Surrealism. Enough of widespread pessimism, he said, I am now beginning a search for joy and pleasure in my work. This picture, a break in the clouds, which one critic described as the deadest picture Magritte ever painted, is still recognizably a Magritte, but without the pipes and bowler hats. After this, Magritte's style changed completely. He became obsessed with the paintings of Renoir, and, attracted by their colors, he changed to a more luminous palette. His objects and figures were looser, lacking the fine detail for which he was known, unleashing color in new, warmer and more cheerful tonalities. The result was not successful, and Magritte's work in the Impressionist vein was so badly received by friends and foe alike, that Magritte himself called them, doomed. A publisher at the time was horrified to see Magritte stubbornly clinging to what he called, his current mistakes. However, even bad paintings, if they are a Magritte, can attract high prices. This one sold at Sotheby's in 2020 for $1.6 million. Magritte's Renoir period ran from 1943 to 1947. During this time, he painted other styles as well. He began to paint the leaf birds from 1942. He called this new style, Surrealism, in full sunlight. He produced around 50 oil paintings and drawings during this period. Magritte considered his Renoir period important enough to make it the basis of a proposed, in-depth reform, of Surrealism. To this end, in October 1946, he and several other Belgian artists signed his manifesto, Surrealism, in full sunlight, which they sent to the Paris Surrealists for their consideration. They rejected it, outright. When the Surrealists curated a show in Paris in 1947, they placed Magritte's sunlit Surrealism paintings in a section entitled, Surrealists, in spite of themselves. You've probably noticed that the men in Magritte's paintings, clad in suits and bowler hats, are dressed from head to toe. The women, on the other hand, are usually naked. Black Magic is a painting of Magritte's wife, Georgette. Her upper torso blends with the color of the sky. Usually, the women in Magritte's paintings are statuesque, untouchable and emotionally remote, and, are shown with eyes closed, or turned away from the viewer. But this is not always the case. Laville, painted in 1934, emerged out of Magritte's desire to explore relationships between visually linked objects. Here, he is showing a correlation between the woman's face and her body. When first displayed publicly in Brussels in 1934, this painting was hung in a separate room behind a velvet curtain, alongside other provocative works by Salvador Dali, and others. The French surrealist considered Laval a key example of a surrealist work, and in 1934, reproduced it on the cover of the book, What is Surrealism? Upon receiving the image, the founder of Surrealism, André Breton told Magritte, it is a marvelously vital and disturbing piece of work, hard to put out of one's mind. During his Renoir period, Magritte revised Laville. As before, her eyes, nose and mouth have been replaced by a naked female figure. Initially, this motif of a woman appears uncanny and provocative. However, for the artist, the interpretation is more complex. Magritte believed that the ideas and thoughts behind paintings were more significant than the images themselves. Here, he is asking the question, how is a woman, and the female body, perceived by a man? Is it as a silent muse? Or, perhaps as a beloved creature? Or, maybe a sexual object? Whatever the case, the blonde woman in Laval is defiantly confronting in her nakedness. When Magritte lived in Paris, he was never able to get the recognition from the French art establishment that he felt his art deserved. 
By the mid-1940s, after his return to Belgium, the French finally began to appreciate his work and, he was invited to exhibit at a Paris gallery. In preparation for the show, he deliberately produced some oddball paintings as a joke to take revenge on the French for snubbing him for so long. Magritte flippantly called these works, his vache paintings, which is a vulgar French word meaning cow, or harsh and unpleasant. The exhibition was accompanied by a small catalogue, written in a slangy style, with the title, Putting One's Foot in It. Seasickness, shown here, is arguably the most interesting painting from this group. It has no nautical elements, yet the title reflects the garish sports coat and slab of ham sweltering in the sun that were intended to make viewers feel mild, visual nausea. Within a few weeks, Magritte, painting in an unexpectedly crude, playful, and intentionally bad manner, had produced about 30 Fauvist-styled works for the exhibition, using acidic color contrasts and shocking juxtapositions that caused an outrage in Paris. This painting, The Mountain Dweller, was one of the most bizarre in the exhibition. It is a portrait of a grizzled bearded man, his face covered with pipes. The painting is fresh and contemporary to us, but in 1948, it could only have been received as an abomination. The exhibition turned out to be, as expected, a failure. Not one picture was sold. The press reacted frostily. The public was appalled. The Parisian surrealists felt they were being got at, and, were duly offended. They stayed away. For exhibition makers, as well as art dealers and art historians, the Vash group of works are an alien element in Magritte's otherwise consistent body of work. Only one of the Vash works was exhibited again during his lifetime, although they were rediscovered more than 30 years later, and have been exhibited since. In 1949, Magritte's principal dealer in the United States, successfully exhibited the artist's earlier works in New York. He then suggested that Magritte forget Renoir and Sunlight to focus his output on images which overwhelmingly appealed to the public. From then on Magritte reverted to the precise and painstaking technique he had used successfully in his earlier work. As an example, this painting, Memory, is striking for many reasons. One of these is the contrast between the white statue and the red blood, which represents a painful memory that the woman must bear. The irony here is that it is the blood that makes this bust come alive. Memory forms such an integral part of who we are. Without it, we are lost. Among Magritte's works are a number of surrealist versions of famous paintings by other artists, but with the human subjects replaced by coffins. Perspective, Manet's Balcony, is Magritte's typically ambiguous representation of objects in an unfamiliar environment. In this picture, three coffins occupy a balcony, two are standing while one sits on a chair, mirroring the scene in Manet's original work. Magritte had a way of jolting his audience to become aware of harsh reality through his paintings. His verbal pun here is based on the word perspective, which in French can also mean prospects, or the fate that awaits us all. He treats the next picture by François Gérard in the same way. Perspective, Madame Recomier, was painted by the artist in 1951. Magritte's painting exactly follows the original version, we see a classic interior with columns, and an upholstered armchair, on which however, sits not a secular lioness from the times of Napoleonic France, but a wooden coffin. Only a yellow shawl that once framed a slender figure, and a small footrest remind us of the original Madame Recomier. In 1950, Magritte created a series of paintings showing organic objects turned into stone. Magritte had experimented turning birds and leaves to stone in the 1940s, but now, the entire scenes is shown petrified. Sometimes referred to as his Stone Age pictures, these works celebrate Magritte's love of paradox. Magritte regarded the state of petrification as a visual expression of disaster and death, a kind of catastrophe, like that at Pompeii, 
when lava brought all movement to a halt. Another petrified work, The Wonders of Nature, painted in 1953, illustrates Magritte's poetic sensibility. Here, he shows two fish-headed lovers, apparently, singing together, like the sirens in Greek mythology. The mood of the painting is similar to works of fellow surrealist, Salvador Dali, yet it conveys a greater sense of whimsy and humor than the more bizarre and sexually provocative paintings of the Spaniard. The conventional mermaid form of a fish's tail and human body is reversed in this painting. This is a theme we saw earlier in the collective invention, making the fantasy even more unreal. Despite their petrification in stone, the figures appear to be very much alive and have an uncannily human quality. Although critics often group Magritte with other surrealists, such as Salvador Dali, Max Ernst, and Yves Tanguy, Magritte took a somewhat different approach to painting. Rather than creating fantasy imagery, he evoked the strangeness and ambiguity he found in reality. I don't paint visions, he once said, I describe objects, and the relationships between them, in such a way that none of our usual feelings are necessarily linked with them. In this picture, the artist shows a room filled with familiar things, but he gives human proportions to them, creating a sense of disorientation and incongruity. Inside and outside are swapped, by rendering the interior walls of the room as the sky. The familiar becomes unfamiliar, the normal, strange, Magritte has created a paradoxical world that is, in his own words, in defiance of common sense. In 1953, Magritte completed one of his major masterpieces, this painting, Golconda, which is named after a city in India. In the painting, hundreds of identically dressed men in dark overcoats and bowler hats seem to float against a backdrop of buildings and blue sky. Magritte himself lived in a similar suburban environment and dressed in a similar fashion. The bowler hat was a common feature of much of his work, as we have seen earlier in paintings like The Menaced Assassin. Bowlers appear more than 50 times in his work over his career, making it one of Magritte's best-known motifs. His painting, The Empire of Light, is an example of the simple paradox that characterizes Magritte's most successful works. Dusk has fallen in the bottom half of the picture, and a street lamp glows. Above, cheerful white clouds hang in a baby blue sky. Although both elements of night and day are calming and lovely, their juxtaposition is somehow eerie and unnerving. The Empire of Light is thought to be inspired by a poem by Lewis Carroll in his book, The Walrus and the Carpenter. Lewis Carroll was a favorite of the Surrealists, and Magritte had already named one of his paintings, Alice in Wonderland. This painting, which is one of Magritte's most popular, was sold for $79.8 million at Sotheby's in March, 2022. Memory of a Journey shows the leaning tower of Pisa supported by a feather and is a remarkable example of the way in which Magritte's art appropriates images from popular culture and turns them into fantastic compositions. He often used reproductions of famous paintings, travel brochures, postcards, and other souvenirs, as sources for his paintings. Magritte's masterpiece, The Castle of the Pyrenees, was commissioned by one of the artist's longtime friends. Though Magritte had complete artistic freedom, his patron was encouraged to express his opinions on the choice of a subject. The friend selected a drawing of a large rock, supporting a castle. As Magritte refined the painting, he decided to exclude other proposed additions, so that it would retain the vigor and harshness he imagined. The Castle of the Pyrenees has become one of Magritte's best-known and most reproduced images. It embodies the artist's typical disturbing juxtaposition of familiar objects, combined with captivating poetry and mystery. This painting started as a self-portrait, but Magritte found it difficult to paint himself, which he described as a problem of conscience. When he finally finished, the result was this nameless man in a bowler hat. The Son of Man, 
is one of just four oil paintings René Magritte identified as self-portraits, but by hiding his face behind a floating apple, the painting defies our expectations of what a portrait should be. Magritte said that he used the apple to hide his face because he wanted the viewer to wonder what is hidden behind the visible. He managed to capture this feeling very cleverly in this work. Magritte continued the hidden face theme with this painting, Man in a Bowler Hat, also painted in 1964. Again, it is a self-portrait, this time with a dove accidentally flying past and hiding his face. Magritte used bowler-hatted men as models for men who wouldn't stand out in a crowd. I want to paint an anonymous middle-class man, he said, I wear a bowler hat, and I am not eager to stand out. Magritte saw himself as a kind of non-celebrity. He was, like his paintings, a paradox. He was very much a surrealist, but there was none of the artistic bohemian about him. Magritte traveled to New York City for a 1965 retrospective of his work at the Museum of Modern Art. Magritte had fairly frequent gallery shows in New York in the 50s and 60s at his dealer's gallery, but none had received serious attention. Magritte was barely discussed in the New York art press, and many critics considered his works droll but peripheral. With the 1965 Museum of Modern Art exhibition featured in both Esquire and Life magazines, the Magritte exhibition succeeded in driving both popular and critical attention toward his figurative surrealism for the first time. Two years later, another major retrospective of Magritte's work was held in Rotterdam, and then another in Stockholm. René Magritte died in August 1967 at the age of 68, after a period of prolonged illness. He was buried in Brussels. He had worked up until his death, and left an unfinished painting. The incomplete work remained on its easel in the Magritte home until his wife, Georgette, died 20 years later in 1986. The 1960s brought a great increase in public awareness of Magritte's works. The paintings have frequently been adapted and plagiarized in advertisements, posters, book covers, and the like. Let's have a look at some examples. The Punched Brothers album, The Phosphorescent Blues, copying Magritte's, The Lovers. Nigerian rapper Jesse Jags's 2014 album uses the man in the bowler hat theme. The logo for the Beatles company, Apple Corps, is inspired by Magritte's painting, The Game of Mora. The iconic poster shot for the film, The Exorcist, inspired by Magritte's, The Empire of Light. In the 1999 movie, The Thomas Crown Affair, the Magritte painting, The Son of Man, was prominently featured as part of the plot. Photographers have also been inspired by Magritte's surrealist ideas. This one was inspired by odd food combinations, and, by Magritte's, the son of man. And here's one, using the theme of the castle of the Pyrenees. The Magritte Museum in Brussels opened to the public in 2009. It is housed in a five-level hotel, in the center of the city. The museum displays some 200 original Magritte paintings, drawings and sculptures, and is the biggest Magritte archive anywhere. The museum includes Magritte's experiments with photography, from the 1920s, and the short surrealist films he made from 1956. Magritte's works are held in collections around the world today, including the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, and the Tate Gallery in London.